What's going on, everybody, and welcome back to the Hush Life Podcast. This week, BMAC is in the beautiful state of Wisconsin with great friend Josh Miller talking all things dogs. You definitely do not want to miss this episode. And if you are listening to this on any podcasting platform, please make sure you leave us a like and a review. It really helps the podcast. It motivates us to create more content of this style for those of you who prefer to listen. Thanks, guys. Boom. We're live. We're live. Live. Um... Welcome back to another edition of the Hush Life Podcast. I am looking over to Lake. I'm in the middle of the United States, Midwestern summers. And I'm going to say right now, the humidity has not been terrible. Not yet. Not yeah, yet. Wait a couple days. It did <laughs> rain this morning, though, so it may materialize shortly. <laughs> yeah, you spoke too soon. I did spoke too soon. <laughs> it, uh, it brings me back to the early days in my life, um, back in... 2001, I actually lived in the Midwest. Some may know this, some may not. And it was post-college, and I was in um, the Minneapolis area and somehow managed to get an internship job for sales and marketing with the Minnesota Vikings in the National Football League. And growing up a sports fan, I got to tell you, kind of felt like I hit a home run. Oh, yeah. That's, That's like every high school kid's dream. I was a huge football fan growing up. I uh, loved the NFL. I was a Seahawks fan, just having grown up in the Pacific Northwest. But the NFL was like the pinnacle of sports. And I don't exactly even know how I got the job. I don't know that I was qualified for it. I didn't have much skill set back then. <laughs> but I honestly think I got the job because I was probably one of the only applicants that wasn't from Minnesota. Mm-hmm. And they're like, okay, here's a guy that's from Oregon, went to school at Arizona State probably not going to be like a huge fanboy. Mm-hmm. Which but, you got to figure that most of their guys are. Oh, most yeah. applicants, right? I would imagine 99% of the applicants are huge Viking fans. Oh, yeah. So anyways, I, I did get the job, um, which was a fantastic experience for my life. Had a great leader and mentor uh, by the name of Steve LaCroix, who was the VP of sales and marketing. Mm-hmm. Young guy, just really fantastic leader. And he encouraged me to get into uh, sales. So it was like a year-long stint for the um, internship. And I didn't st- end up sticking with the sports marketing predominantly because primetime NFL season is also primetime hunting season. Right. And so there wasn't – if you're working for the NFL, although you only have eight home games you got to be there for, at least back then, you still are primetime in the fall. Like training camp kicks off middle of July and you don't typically finish the season until December. Mm -hmm. So there goes September elk hunts. There goes October rifle mule deer hunts, water, you know, water, the whole nine is gone. Right. Right. But the good news is working for the Vikings, at least you weren't like going into January too. (laughs) You know, like if you're, if you're working for the Packers, you'd be having to work all through, (laughs) all through January every year too. Touche. (laughs) Touche. But it was a cool experience. It gave, gave me an introduction to the Midwest. Um, Although I only made five dollars and fifteen cents an hour, that that was a really? little tough on the pocketbook. But the experience was worth the weight in gold, in my opinion. Right. But anyways, it, this trip has reminded me a lot of those days and the you know the summer lake life and mm-hmm. and what have you. But uh, I am joined by somebody that's become a good friend in a short period of time. Mm-hmm. It's uh, I always man, I feel like. A lot of things happen for a reason in life, and this is an example of one of those that seems to come for, to fruition. Um, I'm going to introduce our guest here in a minute, but to kind of reflect back, some folks that follow along on our channel um, or on social may have been aware that my wife and I had to put down our yellow lab, Deucey Boy, of 13 amazing, incredible years um, early in 2022. And the amount of like response that I received uh, from so many people was really overwhelming. And I think dogs are just so special. Uh, if you have them, you know what I'm talking about. Mm-hmm. If you have a working dog, you really know what I'm talking about. But they just, they they become such a huge part of your family. They are just incredible companions. And man, when you got to say goodbye, whew, talk about an absolute heartbreaker. I don't think there's anything I've been through in my life. And maybe that's just, I've been super fortunate so far that was as hard as having to put him down. Hmm. Um, 
we knew that he wasn't doing great because we found out last September that he developed a form of cancer and just suddenly started having issues with calcium level and issues like with his organs and stuff. And so uh, we were fortunate that we got a few more months with him to kind of like prepare ourselves. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't sudden, but it didn't make it any easier. We threw the kitchen sink at him from medication and everything we could try to do with cancer. But we also valued his quality of life and we didn't want to keep him breathing. We wanted to keep him alive. And I think once that point in time comes where you got to make that hard decision, we both knew we were on the same page. We woke up one morning and he just really couldn't get around. And uh, we had to make the tough phone call. And I honestly wasn't able to do it. Like mm-hmm. Corey had to do it for me. Um, but we, we did it in our home and it was comfortable. And we, you know, we got to say our goodbyes and it was the right way to do it. But man, was it hard. Mm-hmm. And from that experience, um, a lot of folks reached out because it, it's just relatable. I think all of us that have owned a dog have been through that. And <clears throat> a, a longtime acquaintance that I've met a few times, but not, not often, uh, by the name of Jeff Lander. Mm-hmm. He's the owner and operator of Primitive Outfitting. So he runs a really cool spring bear hunting camp in British Columbia. And then he also runs a moose hunting operation and then a really fantastic mule deer upland bird hunting operation in Alberta later in the year. But Jeff reached out to me and uh, was touched by what we had shared and our story with Deuce. And he just said, man, I don't want to seem overbearing and it might not be the right time, but when you're ready, I need you to meet somebody. And I'm just so grateful that Jeff did that. And he was very passionate about you and I meeting. Mm -hmm. It's like he just knew. I don't know. It was very interesting. And uh, right after we put Deuce down, the next day, we, my wife and I flew to Mexico just to kind of get away. We needed a break. We needed the stress reliever. And during that point in time, she, after a couple of days, after some tears and some mar- margaritas, she uh, pulled up this Instagram page and just showed it to me and said, hey, look at this breeder. Like, these guys look like they got a cool operation. And I didn't think a whole lot about it, but it happened to be you're in your wife's page. So there's another little angle there. And then a few years back, um, somebody that uh, I was were friends with in the, in the industry had picked up a real nice look in the yellow lab. And I had reached out to him and said, hey, man, where'd you get that dog? Great looking dog. And he had given me the name of a kennel. And I was like, oh, cool. And I never really thought about it again because the timing wasn't right. But as I reflected back and kind of started looking at the puzzle pieces, that person who got that dog also came from you (laughs) so there's all these variations um so that's the lead up to who i'm joined by today his name is josh miller he and his wife whitney miller own riverstone kennels they are the host of duck dogs podcast and it's spelled Mm d-u-k we'll get into that here shortly and then they also own a training program that is online based called retriever roadmap for those that are interested in walking down their own path with their own dog. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, Josh, welcome to the podcast, man. Man, it uh, it's one, it's so good to have you guys here. And I cannot echo what you just said enough. You know, it's, I, I think the longer that I live, the more I believe in that things happen for a reason, you know, and it's like everything that you, that you just talked about, you know, I, man, like, like it, it's very, it's, it's, it's difficult to get close to somebody. Yeah. I, I feel like, especially in an industry where like usually people are, are connecting with you to, you know, for a leverage reason, right? Business wise, personal wise, but like, man, like in a very short period of time, we went from not knowing you guys to like, Whitney and I genuinely love you and Corey, you know, like feel like super close talking on a regular basis outside of dogs, you know, Turkey hunt together already, you know, and, and shoot, you know, we just met each other six months ago or whatever it was, you know? So it's, it's just everything you talked about was to me, it's just good people lead you to more good people. And it's just so important to keep your circle with the right people. Cause it just, you know, it, it just fills your cup, you know, more and more. Um, but, uh, as much as I hate everything that you went through, 
I'm I'm incredibly happy with you know where it led and yeah. you know obviously our relationship with that and you know literally while you're telling the story of of Deuce and I I, I don't mean you know to you know continue the the sadness oh, you know yeah. of this whole thing it's kind of a somber way to start this uh, this episode out but you're telling that story and right above you is a, a photo of my first dog Easton yeah. and man like it went through all the same stuff you know it's like. He, I, I literally wouldn't be here. I would have my business. I wouldn't be on the property I have. I wouldn't have anything that I have in this world today if it wasn't for that dog. That's how impactful that dog was to me. And it's like you, you fast forward to the end and it's like did everything exactly what you're talking about, right? Like nobody likes talking about the last day. But it's one thing that every one of us, we've, if, if you get a dog just like you're getting tomorrow, you're you're voluntarily signing up for that that heartache again, but if the journey wasn't worth it, none of us would go through it, yeah. right? Like you, like it is it is so impactful, and they they just fill our lives, and there's so much joy that comes about that. And it's like I look at that dog, and it like it broke my heart. You know, to to I I cannot tell you the number of days I prayed, like legitimately prayed, that I would wake up and he would just peacefully went into sleep. Like that was to me that was like the absolute best situation. Mm-hmm. Very few of us get the opportunity to do that, which we have to make that that tough decision. And you know, for me, everybody always always asks, like, when do you know? When do you know? And you you can't explain it. You just know. Mm-hmm. And and to me, I think what happens is you you hit a point where you realize you're doing it for you and not for them. Yeah. And I think you know, for those of us that truly you know, have our dogs as such a part of our family, when that hits you, it's like it's time. You yeah. know, there is that fine. Fine line, yeah, and yeah, I'm 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 grateful too that my wife and I were on the same page, and we weren't, you know, battling back and forth with each other on one thinks we should continue and the other doesn't. Mm-hmm. So that part, that was you know assuring, and man, I needed her and she needed me, and that was just a a no fun moment. But to your point, it, it just it's the eventual conclusion to every every dog you own mm-hmm. um and i feel grateful that we got 13 years you know there's many cases oh where yeah it's much sooner so it did lead us to want to have another puppy in our life mm-hmm. we um we've shared this too like we've not been able to have children and uh years ago we shared kind of a, a little bit of our story there and also overwhelmed by the response from that and so like we're we need a dog to make like our family complete Mm -hmm. and um that's what gets excited we you know we wanted to take a little break and kind of have some time to ourselves and do some traveling and uh the amount of care that he deuce required like the last couple months was was a lot my wife is a rock star she literally kept him alive um because his his condition made it to where he wasn't super interested in eating a lot. Mm -hmm. And so she was like hand feeding him with a syringe and making sure he had the nutrients to continue to, to to fight. Cause he was able to like get around and stuff at that point. He just wasn't super hungry, but we took some time. Um, and on that Mexico trip, uh, you know, I think was the, the very first sign of like, we need to start considering what our next dog's going to be. And to be honest, it was a little overwhelming um, we got deuce off of a pull tab number on Sportsman's <laughs> Warehouse that my dad found. And I'll be damned if he wasn't the best freaking pull tab dog you could ever find. <laughs> and uh, and so it's like, it's been 13 years, right? I hadn't looked for a dog since. Where do you even begin? So we naturally started looking at like the KSL classified ads and, you know, other things. And it's just overwhelming because you don't, you don't necessarily know what you're going to get. Nothing against backyard folks that are kind of just running this, you know, breeding the dog they have. Several of them, those are great, but you don't really know the backstory. You don't know what the conditions are. There's just a lot of unknowns buying them off like a classified ad. And and then, you know, I, I got a, a message from Jeff shortly thereafter, and it, it didn't take a whole lot of time for us to kind of realize you guys have built a really nice business and just doing the, the research and looking into it. It was super eye opening, mm-hmm. and uh, that at least brought a little bit of like enjoyment to the fact that we don't have to worry 
Because mm-hmm. <laughs> we reached out to a few places, we didn't even get like an email response. I'm like, man, <laughs> must be nice to have a business where you don't even have to reply to inquiries about, you know, right. your product or your service. So that's uh, well, that is kind of like how t- got that. Yeah, I, I gotta tell you my like my side of that story for sure. Because Jeff was playing middleman on this thing, he, right? He indeed was. So he he reaches out to me and he goes, man, like you you got you got to watch this film, right? And it was you guys talking. Yeah, you know, about losing dues, and like I'm just like, man, like, uh, like I don't want to watch that, you know, because <laughs> yeah. like, yeah, I, I've been through it, you know, so many times now that it's like, it kills me, right? Because like naturally, you reflect, and it's probably I assume the reason so many people empathize with your situation in that video, because so many of us have gone through it, we can relate to it, and even if you can't relate because you haven't gone through it, you're likely looking at your four-legged buddy at your side, going, oh my gosh someday that will be me you know so it's relatable to so many of us and uh he's like man you gotta watch man you gotta watch i'm like ah you know okay and you know of course you killed me but what was neat about it to me is it did give me a feel for you guys yeah like you know okay like you know these guys genuinely you know love this dog they care about you know the dog there's you know it seems like you know good people and uh so he's like hey he's like you got a message you know, got a message BMAC, got a message BMAC. And I'm like, I'm not messaging him, <laughs> you know? And he's like, you got to message him, dude. And I'm like, why can't you just like do the, he's like, I've already told him about you just, and I don't know, like, I love Jeff to death, but like, I don't know, like sometimes he feeds me lines where he's like, Hey, you got to do this. I set you up. And then I'll like call somebody and they're like, who are you? Yeah. Like, and I'm just like, and Jeff just knows like, you just got to meet this person. You just got to get out there. And I'm like, man, like I, and I remember word for word. He's like, why, why not just message him? And word for word, I said, I don't know, it feels a little fanboyish. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and his response was, what? With like five question marks. And uh, I don't know, like, you know, I, I think I sat out for like another day. And the biggest reason why I think I didn't reach out right away is because when I went through, uh, going back to Easton, yeah. I, when I went through that with Easton, and I like he was in my arms when he passed, I literally felt his last heartbeat. Like it was so impactful for me. And we have the kennel, right? So we've got 35 dogs that need to be trained. And uh, fortunately enough, I have a team of people and, you know, trainers, office, you know, care. So, like, I don't need to be there if something's going on. Well, I I needed to not be there. Like, I just mentally, I just, I couldn't do it, right? I mean, it's literally the house that he built, like, it's too raw, right? So I bet I took a week or more before I could actually you know, go up to the kennel and there's actually a cool story, you know, because Jeff was a part of that, you know, too, with the dog that he had in. And, uh, you know, it's like, gosh, I mean, it's, they're, they're just, you know, there's just so, there's so much there. Right. And it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a, it's a journey for sure. You know, and it's, um, I kind of lost my train of thought where I was going with that, but well, it's, walk us through the story of kind of how you got into the training component of it and mm-hmm. how Easton tied into that. Yeah, so um, really what I like to tell people is uh, I was kind of the black sheep of my family. So my family, being in Wisconsin, you know, deer hunting specifically, rifle, is a big deal. And uh, love archery hunting. I I just never was crazy about rifle hunting whitetails in Wisconsin. And, I, you know, I love that people do. It just wasn't my thing, you know. And so we had a cabin, or my grandpa, I should say, had a cabin in nor- uh, northern Wisconsin, and we would go up there every weekend as, as a, well, I shouldn't say as a family, the boys would all go up there. And so my uncle would be up there. My grandpa would be up there, you know, my dad, my brothers. And we'd get up there and it was a deer hunting trip. And I just loved duck hunting. I don't know why. Like my dad wasn't a big duck hunter. Like I, like, like I have, you know, behind you, I have that little blue wing teal decoy. I had three of those. That was how I duck hunted. Like, and they're these old little junky, like they don't even hardly look like a duck. Right. But th- that's how I hunted. So what I would do is they would go out. Uh, my grandpa had 80 acres across the road, but he lived or his cabin was on a lake. So they would go out in the morning, go deer hunt, go get in their, their stand. I'd get in a little canoe with my three little blue wing teal decoys. And <laughs> there's no way there's any blue wing teal, you know, at least in that area, anytime past September. Right. So it's like I have my three blue wing teal decoys, I paddle out, sit on this island, hope to see a duck. And I mean, if I shot a duck, it was an awesome day, you know, and it was just, that's that from that, I had a passion that grew of like, I want to get more into this, you know? So I really got into calling, really enjoyed learning how to call, um, 
got more sideways looks than uh, than I know what to do with when I was driving. I'm 16 years old and I'm blowing on a duck collar a goose call on my truck and people are like, what in the world is going on there? Um, but I just loved it. But you do it by yourself enough, like you want to have someone to share it with, right? And so my way of doing that was a dog. And of course, you, you know, as a waterfowler or an upland hunter, I think a lot of us want to have that dog for what the dog brings to the hunt. I mean, I, to me, I'm at a point that I would rather not go out than go out without a dog, yeah. you know? But at the time we had two labs, um, neither one of them hunted, neither one of them quite frankly cared to even play fetch. Like they were just you know, great house dogs, but you know, my dad wasn't a bird hunter, right? So we didn't train him, didn't do anything with him. And so, uh, I was told that I had to buy Easton if I wanted him, um, which I didn't know, of course, it was him yet. But so I umpired Little League games, saved up my pennies, and basically did exactly what you did, which I, you know, newspaper ad, you know, labs, you know, for sale, exactly how I tell people not to shop now because I hit the lottery. Yeah. You hit the lottery. You don't hit the lottery very often. Yeah. You know, and so it's like you get lucky once, awesome. But then you learn you do it better. You put the odds in your favor, you know, like, um, anyway, get East and, and, uh, I, I worked with him all the time. I have a very obsessive personality. If I get into something, I just, I want to be the best. I want to do it to the best of my ability. And so I just pour myself into whatever, you know, I'm doing. And so in high school, I was a three sport athlete. I played football, basketball, and baseball had a lot, you know, kind of going on with your know, family life and everything. And so my time with Easton turned into my me time. Like I just, I looked forward to that time every single day. So I watched every DVD I could, read every book I could. You know, I, I tell people, and I very seriously think this, I probably made more mistakes with Easton than every dog I've ever trained since him combined. But he was just that dog that dealt with it. You know, like I'd make a mistake. He was forgiving. We'd move forward. He was, and not every dog is like that, you know, but he was. So Sportsman's Warehouse, funny you bring that up because that's, that's where my story leads me. So there's a Sportsman's Warehouse in um, in Minnesota. And actually, the, the guy who owned Sportsman's Warehouse and started lived like two miles from where we're sitting right now. No yeah, so kind of funny. But um, so I'm in the Sportsman's Warehouse. I'm in a dog aisle just looking at the dog's stuff. And there's an older gentleman in the aisle. He just probably saw a young kid I think it was probably 17 because Easton would have, so I got Easton when I was 15 going on 16. And so I was probably 17, somewhere in there. And uh, he, he comes over, he goes, you got a dog? I'm like, yeah, you know, kind of small talk. And he's kind of feeling me out. Well, it turns out he's the secretary for the local retriever club. He's like, man, you really should come down, check out where I'm about. We'd love to get younger people you know, involved, you know, and so it gives me contact info. And I wasn't going to do it. Yeah, I just, I, I think probably out of nerves more than anything, like you put yourself out there and like, I don't know what I'm doing. Like, sure. I have a dog I think is good, but you know, I don't want to go, you know, put myself down or you got to get knocked off my pedestal. Right. But I did. And I went over there and, uh, I had no idea the level that I had Easton trained at. I mean, he was phenomenal. I mean, we went in there and I think, you know, this good, they have they were really big into AKC um, hunt tests, but also they were running field trials. So I kind of went like where they were training for more of the hunt test stuff at first, you know, so they have junior season or senior and then uh, master level. So <laughs> I think at first they were thinking, well, we're going to you know, easy into the junior level. Well, by the end of the, that session, I mean, I was running with the master level dogs and standing out. I mean, he, like, I had no idea, you yeah. know, I'm just, I'm trying to do what these books and DVDs tell me to do. <laughs> and uh, so everyone's raving, right? They're like, you got to, you got to campaign them. You got to do this. You got to do that. Like, I didn't even know what campaigning meant, you yeah. know, I'm like, okay, you know, and a little overwhelming, but I remember going back and like telling mom and dad how awesome he did and awesome he was. And like, I remember my dad was just like, yeah, like we knew he was good, you know, but it's, yeah. it's like, it's different than when you see him up against all these other dogs and he's excelling. So probably about a month after that, this group put on what they called a fun, a fun run, you know? So it was basically, it was a field trial that would, it didn't count for anything. So you didn't get points, didn't get, but it was to try to bring new people into the sport, encourage them. Everyone's hoorah, rah, like, yeah, like there were placements, but not real. Like it was more of a learning thing. Right. And, uh, so we went and, uh, Easton won the trial 
and it was the most expensive piece of material, that little blue ribbon that I got that I've ever received in my life. Because from that point forward, I was all in, you know, I was like, now we're running hunt tests. Now we're traveling, you know, to go do this stuff. I mean, man, like I, I couldn't, I couldn't afford to put the gas in my truck to get to the event, let alone pay the entry fee to get in, you know? And, but, um, Easton, he just, he, he just special, man. Like he just, he was that dog that just made people say, wow, the number of times that, you know, that, you know, he had, um, a retrieve on a hunt or like a, a moment in a, in a event, like people, people still tell me about stuff that they remember Easton doing. And he just had this thing about him. And, uh, at the time I'm like, you know, and I, I remember this vividly at, a, at an event, um, I had a really you know, an old, older guy, super nice guy. Unfortunately, he's not with us anymore. But at the time he came up, he's like, young man, he's like, you get a dog like that once in a lifetime. And you got him as your first dog, so have fun with the rest <laughs> of them. <laughs> and I, I remember that to to this day. But I'm here to tell you that's not true. Yeah, you know, like I, I can tell you, like I never thought I'd have that special dog again. Well, and then I get Brock. Yeah, yeah. and then I get Strike, and then I get like like there's you there's special dogs. I just believe you get like these dogs to me, just like people. They're inserted into your life when you kind of need it the most, right? So like Easton for me, Brock is special. Brock is better than Easton ever was. But I don't know if I would have been able to elevate Brock to where he is without the lessons Easton taught me, right? right? And then, you know, and then that trickles into strike, right? And like what I can do with strike because of what these guys taught. And just like, it's just like, you know, it's just they're special for their own reasons, you know, and, and you don't ever fill a hole. You just, you know, you just create that new spot in your heart. And so it's, uh, just like, I'm sure you're going to experience with this puppy, you know, like, I'm sure you're going to love, like not the, you're not replacing. No, you're just, you're bringing, you know, new in and you're, you're fulfilling a spot in your family that is voided right now, you know, and, and that's kind of what you're looking for. So going back to, uh, Easton and after you kind of, had these initial entries and really started to see a ton of success. What, what did that end up transitioning into? Like, how did you go from a young teenage (laughs) kid that just like had a hobby of waterfowling and then, you know, you get this dog and like starting to really develop a passion for the teaching portion of the dog stuff, Mm -hmm. but yet you're still super young. Mm -hmm. What is the transition period from like, once you kind of got up and running and realized you really, a have something here with Easton and then B, you could see yourself like really getting into deeper levels of training. Mm-hmm. How did you kind of bridge that gap from transitioning to a young person just out of high school to later, but you know, down the road through college and mm-hmm. early in life? Yeah. So what was funny is that like, I just, of the guys that I know and gals that have been successful, like really successful with the dog stuff, the very few of them have set out and I was like, this is what I want to do for a living. Like there's just something like an Easton for me that leads you down that path. Him being successful made me confident, made me go, Oh, I love this. Right. Like if he wasn't good, I never would have enjoyed it. I wouldn't have looked forward to my time to train with him. I never would have been you know, successful in front of other people, which made people think that I was great. He was great. I was certainly not great at that time at that time for sure. Um, but it gave me the confidence of wanting to do it. You know, so at the time, it sounds silly now, but like I thought I was going to be a professional baseball player. Like that was my thing, right? Like that's what everybody was telling me. That's what like in my head where I was at. That's what I was going to college to go do. Like this is all my eggs there. But in the summers, what I would do is you know, I had ball, but I would train underneath different trainers, you know, because I just, I really enjoyed it. And if I was going to have a job, I wanted to have a job I enjoyed. And so I started learning what people do, why people do it, what I liked that people did, what I didn't like that people did, and kind of starting to understand the other ins and outs of this thing. And one of the things, probably the biggest thing that I learned was that, like your experience, okay, no phone call back, no follow through, no follow up. This this isn't a hobby. If you're going to make this a business, it is a business. It needs to be treated as that. But so many people get into their hobby, want to make their hobby their profession, but it still stays a hobby, you know, from, and it can't be, it needs to be a business. I I learned that very early on. 
so I started kind of looking at this and watching it when I realized that I, you know, wasn't going to be as good as Ken Griffey Jr. <laughs> <laughs> then I was like, okay, yeah, I kind of throttled it back down to this is what I want to do. And at the time, Easton was still, you know, pretty, he was getting older, right? But he was still, he was still pretty sharp. And uh, so I remember when I started the kennel, um, I had a mentor of mine by the name of Rick Grant. And Rick is probably one of the most significant people that I've had in my life. So I trained under Rick, mentored under him. He taught me a lot, um, taught me a lot, both what to do and what not to do. Yeah, we, we talked pretty openly about that. And, uh, you know, he, he trained in a different era than I did. You know, I think he was, you know, a little more old school in the approach, but the dogs were also more old school. Like when Rick retired, he literally called me. He's like, Hey man, like, I think I'm done. And I'm like, what? Like, you're not going to retire. Like you're not the, the kind of retiring. He's like, man, like there's a reason you're being successful. And it's because these dogs are different today than they were 20, 30 years ago. Like back then, like my approach worked really well. Now I have a hard time communicating with some of these dogs because they're so much softer. Like they're more of, you know, uh, your companion, you know, yeah. like I want that fire breather that I can smack over the head with a two by four and it doesn't phase him. Right. Like that's, that's not my dogs, you know? Yeah. And so, um, he's like, man, like I just, so anyway, rewind. I'm going to start my own business, right? It first to get to that point was extremely intimidating, you know, because I have a fiance at this point, we're going to start a life together and I'm going to take a leap of faith of go, I'm going to put all my eggs in this basket. Um, fortunately enough, my wife has always been my biggest supporter. She's always believed in me. Um, even maybe when she shouldn't. And, uh, that's really why it, you know, I had the confidence to do it. So, I call Rick. I'm like, man, like, how do you get started in this? And he kind of walks me through things. So for about probably five, six months, I was trying to scrounge up, like, how am I going to start this kind of like, I, I had purchased a house. It had a shed on it. How I was going to make shift that shed? I didn't know. But you started looking at kennel, like kennel runs was like thousands of dollars just to get kennel runs. I don't have thousands of dollars, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm like, how, how to make this work? So Rick calls me one day and he's like, hey, I know you're trying to get this going. And I really believe that you have an extreme talent for this. And I have a way that I can help you. I have six kennel runs. They're outdoors. They've been out there for 20 years. They're rusty. They're junky. But it'll get you going if you want them. And I'll give them to you. Wow. So I borrow a trailer, drive down there, disassemble them, get them back here, put them back up. And I bet I spent the next week and a half... I had a file and I literally filed every piece of chain link. So it didn't look rusty anymore. And like tried to polish up the best I could. And, uh, when I got done, it was late one night I got done. I kind of stepped back and I kind of had my hand over my face. I'm like looking at, at these kennel runs. I was just in my own little world. So Whitney, you know, my, at the time fiance, now wife, you know, walks in, she goes, what are you thinking about? And I kind of snap out of my days and I look at her and I'm like, how are we ever going to get six dogs in the train? It was just completely beyond me. Well, flash forward to today, in the kennel right now, we have dog, we have 35 dogs in for training. Uh, we're full all year round. We have trained dogs from uh, 49 states. We have trained dogs from six different countries. Um, I mean, just like, it's incredible. You know, and just the way it started to the way you know, it is now. And at the time, man, like when I, when I had that, those kennels up and I'm getting going, I called every guy that I mentored under. I'm like, man, like if there's a dog you don't want, I want it. So I was getting like, I had two dogs try to eat me. Like I had like <laughs> serious <laughs> aggressive cases. I had serious anxiety cases, so like huge, like mega bad gun shyness cases. Um, we had dogs that came in that were abused by, you know, other trainers, other people, like stuff like that. But it's also how I made my name was I could take these severe cases, flip them around and do something with them, mm -hmm. you know. And so it uh, it was really neat, you know, kind of, you know, looking back on where you know, we came from 12 years ago to where we are today. You know, it's, it's been a ride. Man, through that process, um, it's it's like so many stories you hear in life or entrepreneurship. A lot of times when you might get to a point where you've. You know, some people will deem you as successful or what have you. Hmm. A lot of people don't know the backstory, right? And like the history and the the challenges, the grit, the perseverance that led you 
to the success. Mm -hmm. A lot of times people just look at what they see current day. Like, wow, man, these guys have like a full kennel. They've got like high demand for their puppies. Mm -hmm. They're just killing life, man. It must be so easy. <laughs> and, um, you know, like nobody understands that it took time. I've, I, I, I saw something recently that said, uh, Nothing that's like fantastic or how's the saying goes. It's something along the lines of like anything that you see in life that's appears to be successful likely has 10 years of effort behind it. Mm -hmm. And just through like the people that we know, you know, they're entrepreneurs themselves. I would say that's pretty dang accurate. You know, looking even back to how we kind of got our story started and how the channel formed and all of us kind of coming together. Um, it's about a decade. Mm -hmm. And I think there's, there's, uh, there's something super refreshing, even though it can be exceptionally difficult in waking up in every single day and being your own boss. Mm -hmm. It's frightening at times. It can come with a lot of stress and anxiety and things of that nature, but the fulfillment, particularly when you finally get to a point where you can provide for your family, and maybe you have some employees and you're providing for their family. The uh, Just like the reward side of that is just exceptional. Mm -hmm. Being your own entity, your own business. You know, you don't have to go to work anymore and report to some other person. You get to do that. And you get to make the mistakes, but also the adjustments to come through that. And, you know, the fulfillment of hopefully being able to do this thing you love continually, like, for your career. Mm -hmm. And it's very unique. Mm -hmm. it's, it, it Not only is it unique, but I think it's something that a lot of people have visions of doing, but there's something that holds them back, right? Like I can't tell you the number of people that talk to me about, oh, I have, I have this idea and I have, but it's scary, right? I mean, it's hard to, to so I'll tell you about, you know, the current kennel that we're at right now. So, when, when I had my first kennel, so that house I talked about with the shed that I made work, right? And then that, you know, six kennels went to 12, 12 went to 16, and then I was full. So I knew I had to expand. Um, technically, I wasn't legal on the property that I was sitting on per, you know, the state and, and uh, county requirements of what you know, constituted a legal kennel. And so I was trying to, like, get by, right? Um, so there was a property we were leasing, which is the property we're on now, that, you know, just you know, when I say leasing, it was like, I gave the guys like a case of beer to be able to run the dogs in the hayfield. You know, it wasn't really a lease, but we got to know those guys that were going to sell it. We were able to come in and buy it. But the reason we were able to buy it is because I put every penny that I made away because I knew that we were going to have to grow this you know, someday. And so at closing, one, I wrote a check I never thought I'd be able to write but you never would have known that we even had it because of how we lived, right? Because I knew I was pushing to this dream. But then two, I had a truck that wouldn't run half the time. I literally had to, to work on my truck to get it running to get to the closing. And that, that's how we have the property we have today. But as we, this is a part, nobody, I, I can count on one hand, probably the number of people that know this. So after this podcast gets out, I can't say that anymore. <laughs> but, um, but we lived, so when, when the kennel was being built, we had to sell our house, of course, to you know, pay for everything, right? So uh, we're waiting for the kennel to get built. Uh, the kennel went up first so that we could have an income. And then the house was getting built. So we borrowed a like a really old like tr like camping trailer. And Whitney and I lived in that trailer th from like, I want to say like May or June through uh, end of November. And end of November in Wisconsin. Right. So, uh, and we would shower in the dog shower that's in the kennel, <laughs> you know, and so that it was parked right behind the kennel. Um, the lowest moment I've ever felt in my life is Whitney and I were living in that trailer and I went to Subway to get us dinner and the car declined because we were overdrawn on, on funds. Literally didn't have enough money to buy my wife a uh, Subway sandwich. The lowest I've ever felt in my life. And here I've got this this property I've worked so hard for, this building that's coming up. This is like my dream. And like this is one of those moments, right? It's like the fear sets in. And it's like, gosh, like did I, did I screw up? 
like, was this the, a terrible decision? Am I going to lose everything? Am I, you know, like oh, some serious you know, doubt. And um, the reason I, I just have never told that story is because one, it's, it's like one of those things, it's like, that's a prideful thing for yeah. me. Like looking back on it, it's like, you know, I could have, I could have let that bury me. But instead it made me pin my ears back and go, I'll never allow this feeling to happen again. I will never allow my family to be in this situation again. And it just pushed me. And so that's why like I level it. So the kennel in, I think it was 20, so what, 2022. So I think it was 2015, one um, emerging business of the year for the state of Wisconsin. The following year, I was runner up for uh, emerging entrepreneur, entrepreneur for the state of Wisconsin. Little Riverstone Kennels. Like yeah. th- th- there had to have been so many other qualified you know, places, but the way that I looked at it is like I was running a business. Like, yes, I was training dogs. Yes, I was using uh, what I had as a talent, but it was running a business. You know, that, and I feel like that's what has made us you know, successful in this is that you run it like a business. It's emotional. I love the dogs I work with. I love the people I get to work with, right? But at the end of the day, if you don't run it like a business, your customers are never going to be satisfied, right? You're not going to run as smoothly and efficiently as you could. You're not going to be able to handle like we have employees that are like, you know, Dave's been working for 10 years now yeah. working for me. He He's still here because we're able to take care of him. We take care of him because we run it like a business. Right. And so that's where like so many of my, my you know, peers that are in this that I see that are in it and out is because it's run like a hobby, you know? And so like, yeah, yes, we're a kennel. Yes, we love the dogs. Yes, we love all this stuff. But at the same time, like, you know, it's, it's our business, you know? I think that you can see that in a lot of industries, you mm-hmm. know, if you're trying to find like somebody to do electrical, HVAC plumbing, um, landscape work, you name it. There's so many like mom and pop kind of run entrepreneurship industries and businesses and a lot of them are highly skilled in their in their field of expertise or whatever, but not necessarily a lot of them know how to run a business. Mm-hmm. You actually can even see it a lot in like the dental field where you have dentists that are phenomenal dentistry, mm-hmm. but they are horrific at running a business. Mm-hmm. And there's companies called DSOs, dental service organizations, that'll come in and like operate the business, business side and then just let the dentist do dentistry. Mm-hmm. And I think that is something that certainly stands out Uh, when you start looking at a lot of those types of crafts is maybe you don't get the greatest communication. Mm -hmm. Maybe like the customer service isn't quite on par with what you hope in your head. Mm -hmm. And it kind of goes hand in hand with any of these industries is you really start to see separation and companies set themselves apart when they just have these basic fundamentals, right? Like, hey, we'll actually call you back. (laughs) We'll send you an email. We'll provide communication. We'll uh, get back to you if you have a question and a message. Just to me, it seems, you know, exceptionally basic growing up my whole career, like a corporate setting where things are really polished. There's a lot of procedures and systems and people. But so many uh, like small businesses, you don't see that. And talk about a place to differentiate yourself Mm -hmm. because of the mom and pop feel that I'm sure, you know, a lot of maybe breeders have. They're probably great breeders and they're probably great at training dogs but they're not necessarily great at running a business. And mm-hmm. I think certainly from our experience, that's where I've noticed um, a big difference. Like as we've been going down this road of getting a puppy uh, into our hands and joining our family, Whitney, your wife, who I'll t- have you tell more about kind of her role in the business, but her level of like communication and detail and organization is really you know, phenomenal. Mm -hmm. It's just next level. And talking with so many other people that have gotten dogs, like my own parents and many other people where, uh, they're not like on site or in the same community as the the puppy. And they need to either have a flown in or they have to go pick it up. They're just, you just don't necessarily see that. Mm -hmm. And man, does that feel good? Particularly when you're at some kind of a distance and you know, you've got the, you're excited. You got this new family member you're going to be joining in and, um, those little details, man, they, they make such a huge difference, not only just in the perception from your customer base, but also like with your, just building like your culture and your employees. And like you said, you, you're, you know, you're running it like a legitimate business because it is, mm-hmm. it's just one that you happen to have a ton of passion behind. Yeah. What's interesting for us from the business side of it is how 
interesting that our communication is with people that reach out to us. And so we look at it as a business, but and may, maybe you get it too, but there are very few you know, businesses or you know, I have a lot of uh, entrepreneur friends. I've tried to surround myself with great entrepreneurs so that I can feed off of them and learn from them. I'm always trying to elevate my knowledge. Um, and so it's interesting how many questions we get on a daily basis via email, via social media. That is, my dog's doing this. How do I fix it? Right? Well, like, I, I know a lot of you know my entrepreneur friends are like, you don't owe that person a response. Like, what are they doing for you? Are they paying you know, for that response? Are they paying for your time? You have paying customers that are their dogs. You, you owe more time to them. It's not how we operate. Like, we're going to help people, yeah. you know? But it is so interesting because, you know, to your point, I wouldn't call my electrician and be like, hey, uh, this is going on. Tell me how to fix it, where to get the parts, you know, what's, what's the price I should pay. Tell me, walk me through how to do it. And then thanks, click, you know, <laughs> yeah. but I can't tell you the hours a week that I spend on the phone helping people through giving free advice. Yeah. It's, it's very interesting in that way. But I, I think at times, maybe from an outside, you know, because my hobby is working with my dog. I want to talk to somebody that does this, you know, at, you know, at a professional level, but it's still perceived as a hobby, right? So it's more of a conversation. That's interesting. Yeah, it really is because mm -hmm. we've met a lot of great people through doing that. Um, of course, they're the people that abuse it. You know, they'll call you every day and you finally you just have to try to politely be like, look, man, like I have people that pay me, you know, to have these conversations with them because their dogs are in here. Like I, I need to prioritize, you know, that time. Uh, most people are good about it, but we do give a lot of, of free, a lot of free advice. Um, but I mean, that's kind of the cool part about the social media side of it too, is you can connect with people and you can help people out. And that's where retriever roadmap comes in. So now we have an online video library that you can, okay, your dog is doing this. That's great. It is, you know, in the, intermediate you know section of retriever roadmap and the the third level whatever it is like break it down that's your answer yeah, yeah like you can go watch it you can rewatch it you can know what to do from there you can build whatever dog you want right that has been really neat mm -hmm. because it it gives people an option to actually watch it right and uh and then you know going back to whitney like whitney it's i think she's fantastic <laughs> you know but it's good to know that you know other people obviously think so too she has the best job in the world you know, it is not easy. I'll be the first one to tell you that because I mean, no, generally speaking, you know, our, you know, so like today, our, our alarms are off at three fifty in the morning. So we try to be like, I'm at the kennel by four fifteen. We're getting, you know, all, everything done before light, you know, I have all the chores, there's stuff that we have to prepare for, get the trailers loaded up. Right. Okay. Now it's light enough. Now we got to get, you know, our work done. I mean, shoot by, you know, nine o'clock, you have 10 o'clock, you have almost a full day of work in, right? But business hours, you got to be available till at least four, right? So then you got, you know, so my team is fantastic in how they handle that. Yeah. It's really easy to burn out, you know, especially when you're out in the sun all day, you're working with animals that naturally are going to test you, right? There's a lot to that. Whitney has the best job in that when people come and talk with her, like she's literally making people's day every time she hands somebody that puppy. Yeah. You know, and, and the business side of it to me for that is the communication that she does. But then, you know, cause you might be asking yourself like, why do I care if my, if the, where I get my dog, whatever kennel is an actual, like why, why does it matter for the business? A lot of the things that you had said, but one of the things for me is that we, we're spending the money and the investment to do things right. Right. So like health testing, you know, there is, I think we're up to 22 health tests that you can run on a Labrador retriever. We run all of them because we want to make sure that the puppies that are being put on this earth by our choosing are as happy and healthy as we can possibly make happen. Of course, with live animals, there's always you know, a potential thing that could come up, but we knew, we know we're doing everything in our control. If you find a place that is having, you know, maybe, you know, one litter a year, one litter every few years, probably not always probably not happening because why would someone put thousands and thousands of dollars into this? Right. Yeah. Cause it is expensive, sure. but for us, it's worth that investment. Right. And so there's a lot that goes into that. Yeah. I mean, I think Whitney does an amazing job trying to like showcase and document 
some of her role. And I think she probably downplays it, but she's an integral part of your guys' business because she literally handles and operates the entire like puppy and slash new business acquisition component of your business where people are coming in to make a deposit on a puppy, pick them up. And then the thing that stood out to me too, just like her passion for the, you know, taking care of the mamas, the whole whelping process, mm-hmm. really f- phenomenal. Like I'd never seen it at that level of detail before. Cause it, I, most places probably don't show that much about, you know, the time the mom uh, starts kind of going into the labor and like mm-hmm. all the details of going to the vet. And it's, it's such a science now. And uh, she has like a really exceptional amount of knowledge and then also the passion behind it. And she does a great job of showcasing it on your guys' like Instagram page. Mm-hmm. You know, the 47 different alarms set when like that mama is due to go into labor. Uh, she's basically waking up every 45 minutes to check on her. Mm-hmm. The temperature controls, the whelping boxes, like all the things that you guys do to document the birth of the new puppies and the daily, you know, measurements and weights. And there's just so much detail there that both my wife and I had never really experienced or seen before. Mm-hmm. And I thought that was super fascinating to, to watch uh, that whole process. So, you know, we've been able to kind of see this time and time again through various litters that have hit the floor. And then, you know, once you finally like are accepted for, hey, this is your litter, and you start kind of getting that communication, boy, it's neat to see because uh, the weekly emails and updates also come with like a weekly video. So you're right. watching your little one literally like, from week one until you end up picking them up at week seven mm-hmm. and uh, super cool, you know, process to see. Mm-hmm. And she's just so passionate about the puppy side of it. Mm-hmm. She is the biggest part of our business, you know, and I love that she has this role because before we were doing the breeding part of it, I can, you know, I can share that yeah, at some point too, but it, it was just the training side. And she was a big part of it then too. She was handling, you know, all the books. She was handling, you know, basically all the stuff that I didn't want to do. And she's a saint for doing it. But everybody would come here and be, you know, Josh, you did an awesome job. Thank you. And be like, um, like when he was a part of it, you didn't see it when he was a part of it too, you know, and she never, and she never once complained, never once wanted, you know, any recognition. She was just doing her role. Well, now she is the role. Right. Like everything starts with her. And if you think about her job, you know, she has to play, you know, she has to play communicator. Right. She has to be a business owner. She has to play accountant. She has to play nurse giving the, you know, the the puppies, the whelping. She has to play veterinarian when something goes wrong. It will administer, you know, shots. You give this, give that. How do I get this puppy out? I have literally watched her on numerous occasions have a puppy be born, stillborn completely lifeless. She brings a puppy back to life. Yeah. One of the absolute most, I don't think I've seen anything more amazing in my life. Yeah. I mean, to watch that and understand the significance. And then when you see that puppy go home, you go, that shouldn't, that, that puppy shouldn't be here. Mm-hmm. You know? And if the puppy's anywhere else, like I would challenge you to find someone more knowledgeable than Whitney on what she does. Yeah. I mean, she is just unbelievably fantastic. But that puppy wouldn't be here. Mm-hmm. You know, again, and so you watch the family get excited and like, the, you know, that little puppy licking everybody's face and how this puppy's going to be a, an integral part of this family. Shouldn't be here, but Whitney made it happen. Yeah. You know what I mean? And and she never tells people that kind of stuff as far as like, she, in, a, in a braggy way. Like she might tell like, hey, this is how, you know, the puppy, but she's never like a look at me. I did this, anything like that it's it is incredible and so the the roles that she has to play the hat she has to wear and she does it in a way that when you talk to her you would think that you're the only client that she has that is a talent for sure i mean i i I hate when i hear people say oh we're just so busy everybody's busy you know how do you handle yourself when you're busy you know do you stay composed do you give the time of day do you you know or do you let your stress and anxiety, you know, seep into everybody else? You know, yeah. that's a culture. Yeah. I mean, her skill set is unique at that. I mean, customer service on the, the, the 10, you know, the 99th percentile of, right. of what you would hope for. Walk us through a little bit about, so you obviously you established the business through the training, mm-hmm. right? Through some heartache and eventually got it to a point where you could kind of take the ultimate risk and purchase a piece of property and start to, de- you know, kind of build out not only your residence, but you're also the actual business operations, the kennel, the office, the puppy mm-hmm. area. How did you guys kind of transition into both having the kennel for breeding 
mm-hmm. and then also the training that you kind of built your foundation on. So naturally, when you have the kennel, breeding makes sense, right? From a lot of levels, right? Because you can start the relationship with an owner early on. You can have an idea of why that puppy was bred for what, you know, what the, what the background's like, what the lines are like. And then you can then train that dog throughout. So it, it, it really does. It's a great synergy, right? But I didn't have a reason of why. Like, I'm a big why guy. Like, if we're going to do something, tell me why. Like, if you can tell me why, let's do it. If you can't tell me why, like, I'm not into doing something just to do it. Again, obsessive personality, want to be the best. I'm not going to do something just to do it. So I didn't have a why. Right. Like I have, um, I, I feel try. So in my career, like again, the retriever stuff, you know, the, the hunt test field trials, love that part of it. And then, uh, one of my mentors, not Rick, but another guy once told me, he's like, you'll never see a retriever trainer go be successful field trialing, you know, pointers because they're so different. Me being a stubborn, hard headed kid goes, well, that's a challenge. And then, yeah, I go do it. So, you know, fast forward three years, I've got, you know, four horses, a horse trailer. I'm, tri- I'm trialing you know, a number of dogs and we had an incredibly successful field trial career, right? So I have, go ahead. Walk, walk people through that maybe aren't as familiar with the difference between obviously the retriever training, field mm-hmm. trials, and what you're talking about on horses and pointers. Like, what is that? Yeah. So, um, so you know, with retrievers, you know, we're looking for a number of things, you know, how they mark. So Mark could be watching, you know, a bird go down, going to picking that up, a blind retrieve. They don't know where it is. So you have to you know, send them, use their whistles, your hand signals. Pointers, um, very different. Right. So your know, pointing dog is out there hunting, finds a bird, establishes what we call a point, which is you don't move. And then the field trials, you have to go flush the bird, shoot, and they cannot move. They have to be you know, calm and steady. Watch that that bird. They can't go just going after chasing you. So it shows not only the talent, but the training. Right. They have to be very you know, under control. The reason we do it off horseback, uh, one, because you can cover more ground. But two, it's kind of that um, that kind of historical this is how you know, you like it, it, they still do it down south a lot like you know george is a big spot for you know, those plantations they still do quail hunts like that but it's just it's traditional right like horses were a part of of that upland game hunting specifically in the south and so we kind of carry that tradition on and i loved it because as a handler now you're handling a horse and a dog at the same time and i just love 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 that challenge and i i love horses too and so um yeah, it, we, a little side note, I couldn't afford really well trained horses at the time. And so we would take our exercise area for the dogs and that was my round pen. And I can't tell you the number of rodeos we had in, the, in, the, in that. I mean, just like, like you, you, you would pay to watch it kind of stuff. It was, it was really a fun time. Um, but you know, we went out, we're very successful, you know, there. And I could have been like, well, like, I've got Ranger, who's one of the most, you know, titled and accomplished dogs in the Midwest. He was an English setter. Well, let's breed him and have puppies. Or I could say, you know, um, a dog named Pancakes, which has a whole other story, wasn't one of my personal <laughs> dogs. It was a, like, super decorated. Like, he's a short hair. Well, let's breed him. But again, I just, I didn't have the passion of the why. Like, I, like yeah, would you better the breed? Probably. But I don't know what female we'd pair him with. And I just, like, there are too many moving parts. This whole time... Okay, so like end of my uh, field trial career, as far as on horseback goes, I'm like, man, like I'm just, it, it, you can't do both. You know, as far as like, you can't keep up both. So who are you? I'm a retriever guy. Okay, well, so go back and go do retrievers, right? That's so bring back to my why. So now I'm back in retrievers, you know, still, and I always was doing it, but now I'm just, I'm focused on it. And uh, this time I hated, hated with all caps, British Labs hated them. And the biggest reason being is that the British labs that I was seeing, they had no motor, no desire, no go, you know, and for a trainer, kind of important things you need to work with, right? Like how do you train a a dog to be a bird dog when he has no interest in birds, right? Or retrieving or like, they're just, there are too many things. And so I didn't like them, but I believe that all of us are breed prejudiced at some point, right? You, you just have a breed for whatever reason and experience the way they look. You just don't like a certain breed, right? But if you see a good one, you'll go on oh, by like that one. That's what happened to me. So I'm working with, I have a British lab puppy come in and I, I remember being like, here we go again. You know, 
bring him out and I'm like, oh my goodness, like this guy is like a rock star, like supernatural, big drive, big. I'm like, okay, hmm, well, you know, there's, there's one good one out there, right? <laughs> then uh, a week later from the same breeder, another one comes in, same thing. I'm like, okay. So I call the breeder and introduce myself. And I'm like, man, like love your dogs. And this has not been my experience with British Lab. So like, tell me what you're doing. What, what are you doing different? So he just tells me about, you know, their idea, what they're going for, all that kind of things. And uh, again, obsessive personality. Um, I book a trip overseas. You know, natural, right? Like you just learned about this. You know, you see two good puppies. Oh, let's book a trip and go overseas. Like you have no idea what I'm doing. So uh, book a trip, go overseas. And through this gentleman, he hooked me up with some people that I could meet and that they would bring me to a trial. So I go to this trial. It's in the very north end of Scotland. I've never been out of this country before. And here I am. You know, I'm probably, I don't know, 25, 26, something like that in a foreign country. No idea who anyone is. Right. But I'm just here to learn about these dogs. So uh, we go out on this field trial, which is super interesting. The first thing I loved about their field trials are they're on live hunts. Our retriever stuff here in the state is on what we call cold game, you know, so it's just dead birds that we're throwing. We want everything to be the same, everything to be fair, and you're judged on how you handle it. Well, they're like, every retriever on a hunt is going to be different, right? Do you get one that's stone dead 10 yards, you know, from you? Do you get a cripple that sails and is running? Like, you, you have to handle this, right? So it's on live hunts. Love that part of it. And so I'm kind of like watching as everybody's filtering in kind of off in the corner and it's literally a cobblestone house. Like it's just, it is as authentic as you can get. And I'm watching, I'm trying to understand what people are saying, which was really tough for me at first. I'm not you know, used to the accent. And there was a, a lady that, that came up to me. Her name was Sam. I'm actually still friends with Sam today. And Sam came up and she goes, you know, good morning in her, you know, thick accent. And I was like, oh, good morning. And she stopped. She goes, well, you're not from around here. <laughs> you know, and I go, no, I'm not. So I introduced myself and she's like, uh, she's like, you want a job today? And I was like, sure. You know, and she's like, well, you can carry game. I was like, oh, great. <laughs> and uh, we laugh about it now because they didn't understand that I was uh, like, vo- like eagerly volunteering to be the grunt of, uh, of the field trial. So what carrying game is, is because it's on a live hunt when they harvest their birds, somebody has to carry them around until the end of the trial. So when we got done with this trial, I've got like, you know, 20, 30 some pheasants around my, like I'm like hunchback, like trying to carry all these games. It was, it was hilarious. Um, but what I loved about it is it put me instead of back in the gallery, it put me right up with the handlers and the judges. So I, I'm watching everything right up close. I just, I was loving it. So we start this, uh, this field trial and I'm watching the dogs and everybody is very under control. So these dogs have to walk off lead at heel under control. And I'm like, all right, you know, the obedience is very good. Birds start flushing, shots start going off, and they start making the retreats. I'm like, okay. A little bit into the, the trial, the first impressive, like my first wow moment was there was a bird that sailed into like this orchard. And the orchard was protected, I assume, because of deer, um, but protected by a fence. It was four strands. And think of a barbed wire fence without barbs. Okay, so it's just a four stranded fence. They send this little yellow female. She runs, and it, you could you could tell it's sale. Like you, it was one of those those birds that's like, this is probably, you know, a, a cripple that's going to run, right? She jumps the four stranded wire, like 100 miles an hour there, boing, over the fence, gone. It felt like a couple minutes. It was probably 30, you know, seconds, you know, a minute maybe. And she comes back with this rooster in her mouth. And this rooster looks like she it's as big as she is because she's a small stature dog. So she goes to jump the fence on the way back. And I'm sure because of this extra weight she's carrying, she doesn't clear it. And she lands on the fence. Her back two paws are on the third strand. Her front two are on the fourth. And she's like back and forth, back and forth as, as the fence is wiggling, right? And she keeps her composure, waits until the fence settles down jumps over the fence, finishes the retrieve. I'm like, that's really cool. Yeah, you know, like, impressive. Yeah. Like, okay. You know, that was athletic. So then we keep walking and, uh, you know, again, I'm watching these dogs, not what I'm envisioning, right? Like big motors, boom, 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 but under control. So we're stopped at a point and the, the trial, you know, because on these big grounds, like the judges are telling everybody, okay, this is the area we're going to push. This is how we want you to work this part of the field. And there was a dog literally sitting two feet from me. 
and I just happened to be looking at him, and he yawned. Okay, so like dogs do, you know, at the end of a yawn, they're, Ew. And when he made that noise, the judge looked at him and he said, he's out. And I was like, what? You know, and, and so later on, what I learned is that no noise of any kind is acceptable. And I'm like, how awesome is that? Because as a waterfall hunter, as a duck hunter, I don't want to spend three minutes, let alone three hours with a dog in the blind that's whining, that's being vocal, right? And I truly believe that's genetics. Like, I think you can create that bad habit, but to make a naturally noisy dog quiet is, is almost impossible. So I love that, right? You can't make a noise to be competing in this thing. Pretty cool. Got kicked out because he yawned. Because he yawned, yeah. And <laughs> and you know what? The handler didn't argue at, at all. Like I was like, oh, that was kind of harsh. Like, and she's like, thank you. Put the leash on, walked him away. I'm like, okay, you know. The last like big aha moment that I had at the trial was uh, it was a um, black male, um, really strong looking dog. And uh, bird sales again, like, you know, any of us that have not know that shot that you know, one leg drops, sails, you know, you're like, gosh, like he's got his Nikes on and is running yeah. 100 miles an hour, right? So he, they send the dog right away. Like, they're really big about picking these birds up as quickly and as efficiently as possible. So when they see a cripple, they immediately stop, send that dog right now. Boom, so send the dog. So this dog goes, gets in the areas of rooster, gets in the area, hunts, 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 and then all of a sudden kind of starts taking, you know, you can't see him but you can see the, the you know, kind of grass moving. So you assume he's on the trail, right? So he's, and all of a sudden, hen gets up. The dog does not get phased. Another hen gets up. Now, you know these are different birds because these two were hens. You know, and the, yeah. there was a rooster that got shot. And I'm watching, like, like th- these birds are getting up, like, in front of this dog. Right? Doesn't get phased. Comes back with that rooster. Wow. And I'm just like, my goodness, like, you never would see that. You know, at least here, because we, it's just the way we, we compete. Right. And I'm like, gosh, like, this is amazing. So we get back. That was after day one. We get back and uh, again, very north end of Scotland. So there's not a lot of availability. So all of the people that were attending the trial were all staying at this one hotel. And it was a hotel with like a little pub attached to it. So I went up and showered, got changed. And my, my shower was like a, a two by two box, you know, which actually the, the funny story is on my last day, I'm in there showering and the sewage from the hotel actually came up. Like I looked down and the the awful smells, it was terrible, but I'm showering from the day, get dressed, go downstairs and I walk into the pub and in the pub, there's this big L shaped bar. And when I walked in the door, I'm right at the end of like the short part of the L and I see all the handlers that were handling the dogs sitting at the bar stool. So I'm kind of like looking like, is there a spot for me to sit? Cause I'm really wanting to talk to some of these guys. And so I come and I turn around, or like turn the corner of the L to where the guys are sitting. I turn that corner and I'm like, I stop and I'm just in awe because all the dogs that I just watched compete all day are laying at the bar stools. Not, you know, you're not sniffing each other, not out of control, not, you know, fighting, not bowing up, not anything. I'm used to, dogs barking and screaming in a trailer in the parking lot, right? Like, I'm just, I'm not used to this. And I'm like, oh my gosh, like what more do we want as hunting dogs? We want dogs that have big motors, athletic, wow factor, but then they can go home and do that. Yeah. Be calm, be quiet, be a part of the family, go to the t-ball game, go to soccer practice. Like that's our life, right? A lot of times you get those high power dogs. They're not that. Okay. So, In this moment, my life is literally changed because now I'm like, here's my why, right? I go back to why I didn't pre before. I didn't have a why. Now I have a why. So I sit down next to a guy. His name is Tom. Great friend of mine. He's an older gentleman. Very accomplished. I didn't know this at the time, but very prestigious as far as what he's accomplished with his dogs overseas. So we sit and literally all night, I'm just trying to soak up as much information as I can, doing a lot of listening, a lot of understanding what they're, you know, ins and outs are and you know why they like certain dogs or why they like a certain retreat so something about the scots i learned that night is they really like to drink i mean like they really <laughs> like to drink and uh i was doing my best to like keep up to a point but i'm also wanting to keep my wits about me so i understand what's all going on and i don't want to be that american that makes a fool of himself yeah, right so i'm like absolutely. i'm trying to be like the middleman so 
as the night goes on, people kind of filter off to bed. Now it's like two in the morning at this point. And uh, it was just me, Tom, and like one other person that was kind of left. But he, I can't remember if he went to the bathroom, but there's something that made it so Tom and I were together just one-on-one. And I was dying to ask him this the whole time, but I finally, like, we've spent all night talking together. You know, he's he's had enough drinks for me. He probably feels comfortable with me. And uh, I was like, okay, Tom, Tom I got to ask you this. Because my perception of what a British lab is up to this point is not what I saw today. I'm, like, when we see British labs in the States, they're, we called them slugs. They had no motor, no drive. You know, they're just not what I saw today. Like what I saw was a dog that I want. Like I would own a lot of those dogs. I wouldn't own the dogs that I've seen. You know, so what's the difference? And Tom had a beer that was, inc- I don't know how much, it, it was a huge beer. And he's looking straight ahead at the bar, takes a big last sip of his, his beer and puts his beard on. He looks at me with a big grin on his face and he goes, Josh, do you really think we're selling you our good dogs? <laughs> and like, I was like, oh my gosh, like I didn't even think about that, you know? And he's like, man, like if we don't want them, they're not going to make our cut. We send them overseas, you know, and then you guys go do whatever you guys are going to do with them. And I'm like, oh my gosh. So I dedicated then the next couple of years of my life of building relationships. I would stay at, you know, people's houses there. I would fly people here spend time at my house, meet my family, train with me, see what I'm looking for in a dog, see what we're doing here, right? Those relationships are why I have the special dogs that I have today because they're able to get me the best of the best, get them here, I can work with them, I can train them and make sure that they're special for me. And uh, I mean, that's that's kind of what led us to be where we are. What a crazy story. (laughs) I know, I know. I mean, again, man, I said it a little bit earlier, and I, I'll go back on this. Um, believing in yourself and taking a risk. Mm-hmm. I mean, not all the time, but I, so many times it pans out. Mm-hmm. And it may not happen right away. It might be a process, you know, and I think I've um, alluded to this before, but like a lot of people have maybe looked at what we are doing at Hush and they express when we meet them at like a trade show or talk to them or what have you, like, I would love to do that. Or I have this idea or I want to get into the industry or, you know, I have these things I'd love to do that you guys are fortunate enough to be able to do. Mm -hmm. How do I, how do I make it happen? And so much of that is developing your plan B, right? If you, if you, if you're in a job or a career that you don't maybe love and you have aspirations to go somewhere else, identifying a plan B and then putting in the effort, the time, the commitment to transition easily from your tra- from your a, a current job to mm-hmm. the one that you want to do. Because taking that jump without any planning, preparation, or strategy, oftentimes you wouldn't be able to go across and make like the same kind of money. If you have a family and stuff, you just can't, too much risk. Mm-hmm. But if you start to identify your plan B, work on making it your plan a and that may take two years or three years or four years the transition becomes easier and doable and it's not as risky you're going to take a leap but you don't have to worry about like bankrupting your family or Mm -hmm. you know becoming homeless or something it's a much smoother transition and in your case like this was a process over time and you took the risk you flew out there you were putting yourself in an uncomfortable new position in a place you've never been with people that have a strong accent and a different culture of drinking. <laughs> right. But all of that was really to me like the game changer mm-hmm. of how you were able to transition from the trainer to the, the just like the overarching kind of brand that you've created now. Mm-hmm. The, the UK. That's right. The and UK the, and the, the UK and duck dogs and duck dogs mm-hmm. stems from that story. British where labs those, where those dogs are coming for yeah so um you mentioned a little bit about brock earlier he's Mm kind of like one of your just elite level british labs Mm -hmm. tell us a little bit about like what you love about brock what makes him so special yeah yeah so if you remember back uh, talking about easton um like he just he just had something about him so i call it the x factor because when a dog has it like you can't tell what it is it's just, it's it. 
Like there's something that just makes people gravitate towards a certain dog. Brock is one of those dogs. Brock, it doesn't matter what, what test we're running on. It doesn't matter what, you know, what hunt we're on. Like that's the story like of, of the day is like something about Brock and he just has this about him. So we were actually, um, this, this fall, we're in a tiny little town in Arkansas. Okay. Hunting with, you know, a friend of ours down there, you know, really a great kid, you know, and, uh, we did, we just had a hunt going to this cafe, you know, for breakfast and, uh, we're just kind of in our own little world. And, uh, my buddy's name is Joey and Joey's like, Hey, like, listen to this. I'm like, listen, what? He's like the table next to us. Listen, they were telling a story about Brock. No way. Yeah, telling a story about a retrieve that a buddy that, you know, one of the guy's buddies was on this hunt and there was this dog from Wisconsin and he went and did this. And the retrieve that, that he was talking about was a retrieve that you can, you can count on. Okay. One hand might be an exaggeration. Very few dogs on this earth will make the retrieve that Easton made on or uh, Easton <laughs> Brock made <laughs> on this one. And so Brock, um, this was a speckle belly hunt. And we were, this was probably three years ago now. And uh, it was just a big feed. Like we're in the spin, right? Like you can't hear the guy next to you talk. I mean, it's just like one of those days, like this is why you do this, right? Like this, this experience. And, uh, but it was a big group of people. I got invited you know, on this hump. There's probably 15, 16 people. So when it happened, it was like, like, I didn't even shoot because I'm trying to figure out where, how in the world are we going to pick all these birds up? Because it's just like muddy soup. It's this big, you know, kind of, you know, uh, like a big cut rice field, but it's just mud everywhere. And, uh, so Brock and I go to work, pick, 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 pick. So we're getting done and like Brock's getting tired. I mean, he's just picked up like 22 specs, like boom, 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 boom. And, uh, and so there's one of the guys goes, there's one more that sailed out there, but I watch him drop. I'm like, all right. Like and he's bringing one back. I'm like, so where was he? And, uh, he's like, well, do you see that, that, you know, that puddle out there? And I'm like, what puddle? And he's like, and he kind of comes over my shoulder. He's like that one right there. I'm like, you mean that one like way out there? And he's like, he's like, yeah. And I'm like, no, I'm like, I'm not sending him on that. You know, like we can go pick that up, you know, with a four wheeler or something. And I just turn away and one of the guys, I don't, I don't, I, of the 15 or 16 people, I probably only know two of them. One of the guys in the blind goes, goes, there's no way the dog would have got that anyway. And I immediately snap back around like, well, now we're doing it, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Challenge. And, uh, so anyways, I line him up, can blind retrieve, right? Cause he, he doesn't know where this is. Line him up back. He takes off. So he runs for a good while and all of a sudden he kind of starts veering off, you know, to the left, you know, just slightly. So I stop him. I give him a cast. And when I cast at him and he turned, I was like, oh my gosh, he's a long way, you know? So he keeps going, you know, and he, he was like, I would have let him go, but I'm looking at him going, uh, you're a really, really long way, you know? And, uh, so I, I always keep in, in my hat, I always, um, I always have a white cloth that I tape or not tape, but I usually, you know, button underneath my hat because for my dogs way out there, you think about when your dog turns back to you and you're going to direct them, you're doing everything in your power to hide in the elements, right? Like the, the best camo, the best, you know, blinds, the best everything. And then we expect our dog from a hundred yards away to turn and pick us out and then take a direction with our hand of everything around us. Like this, it's kind of a ridiculous thought even. So for my dogs to get way out there, I'll take my hat off and flip it around. So that's white underneath and I can you know, give them a little better aid of, of where to go. But he was so far away. I'm like, I'm going to stop him again because I don't know how much longer I'm going to be able to communicate with him. He's that far away. So I, I give him a, a long tweet, you know, he slows down stops. And when he's looking at me, like, I'm like, this is, this is the farthest retrieve he's ever had. You know, I just, I, I knew it from that point. So I gave him, you know, a back cast again, just to kind of give him that confidence, keep pushing back. But I knew I was probably, I probably didn't have any more communication with him. So he's going, 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 going. And all of a sudden his body moves and you kind of see him like go like hard to the right, but 
man, he's a speck out there. Like he is a dot and like nobody can see. So my buddy Rob Snell, who owns Gundog Supply, was with me. He has like he great guy. You'd love you gotta meet him. So he's a he's a great guy because he has never once pulled the trigger, but he loves taking photography of waterfalls so much. He will be the first one up. He will be the most chipper happy guy. And he just does the camera. Like That's he just awesome. loves it. But he's got a mega, mega, mega lens on. And so we can't tell like what he's doing, if he's coming back to us, if not. And then all of a sudden, like after time, we're like, oh, he is coming back to us. And somebody goes, does he have the bird? And you just hear Rob go, yep. <laughs> <laughs> and he was so exhausted when he got back. Like he literally handed me the bird and laid down. Like he's just like, he's, he's done, right? So because we had to know, we took the side by side and uh, we hit the, you know, the, the odometer and we did a trip out there. It was 26 yards short of a half mile. Wow. A half mile. Unbelievable. Right? And uh, so we we knew we were almost to a half mile. We could see where he turned off and where that bird was, you know, just from his tracks in the mud. And uh, so we just drove it off until it clicked a half mile. And then we walked it back to just see how far it was. 26 yards short of a half mile. Wow. It's, it's incredible. Like, you can't fathom how far that is until you're in that moment. I mean, it, it is one of the most impressive things that I've ever seen. He made one more retrieve um, in North Dakota where we sailed a burn. He had to go um, down a big hill, up over a gravel road, which we could see. You know, I wasn't going to send him over a road. That obviously, it was going to be dangerous, but I could see the gravel road all over the gravel road, down over the next hill, and then we lost him. Comes back over the hill with that that hawk, and we figured that one was probably about 600, 700 yards. I mean, just like it's it's incredible. Like it it takes a heart that you can't teach to yeah. do that that kind of stuff. And uh, he's just got again, it's just it. Like he, there's just something about him. Strike. He's got it. You know, like he has a crazy story you have to begin with, but he, like his thing, you would never guess that he's as talented as he is. Because of how calm he is. Like if he was sitting here, he could be sitting here. He's not, but he could be sitting here right here next to us as we're doing the podcast. And he'd be laying here, completely calm and quiet, content in his own world, like the, the the ideal house dog, right? But then to watch him go do some of the things that he does in the field. I mean, he had. So I have a notebook that I keep with me. I travel with me every hunt. Afterwards, I mark down with tallies how many retrieves. So I have a Brock page, a strike page, a Bud page, a Clyde page, a Bracken page, you know, and just a page for all my dogs because I want to keep track of how many retrieves they have. So I have, you know, ducks, geese, dove, you know, know, the whole thing, right? Because when we talk, you know, back at the beginning, when we talk about that last day, those are things that are going to be very impactful to me. I'm, I'm going to be able to reflect on that and be like, gosh, like I gave him this life, you know, like I, I, he had 3000 retrieves. Like, you know, that's something that like you can, you can think about it, but like, that's going to be very meaningful you know, to me. And then what I've started to do just in the last couple of years is because these dogs, like they've been making these unbelievable retrieves. So I've, I've started writing down. So on, on Onyx, I can map out, you know, point to point, yeah. you know, so it's not exact all the time, but it's a pretty close. Cause I can look at it. How far was that retrieve? And I'll write it down yeah. because like, I, I look back and I was like, gosh, like I don't have my notebook here. I wish I did now, but like. Gosh, he goes, strike at a blind that he ran last year. It was 524 yards. You know, like, that's crazy. You know, that's crazy. You know? And so, but now I can keep that and I know it, right? And so I I write those down for all the dogs now. And I, uh, man, it's just, you know, this little stuff, you know, it's it's just, you know, it's it's why I enjoy being in the field so much. It's just, you know, I look at these dogs and there's nothing, literally nothing on earth that they would rather be doing than going and working and being present in that moment. And if we could all learn to be more like that, we would all live way happier lives. Ain't that the truth? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, the last few days I've been hanging out with Josh and Whitney and his entire team and really just trying to capture some of the essence of their business and their brand and their passion. And we'll be putting together a video. It could already be up. Maybe it'll be up here shortly, but it'll coincide nicely with the podcast. Just to kind of give you an idea of um, some of the, the work they're doing uh, you know, Dave is, is handled largely a lot of the obedience based kind of training. Mm-hmm. He's been with you for 10 years. Yeah. Really passionate also with what he does. Super passionate shed hunter. So he's mm-hmm. got a lot of the capabilities for the shed training for those that are, you know, more kind of inclined to do that than maybe the waterfowl stuff. 
And then, you know, Josh is working a lot with the more advanced dogs. Mm -hmm. And so I got to spend time with Brock, with Strike, with Solo, with Bracken, kind of with your entire, like, dude pack of studs. My crew. Your crew. And the thing that just is really fun to watch as an observer is, you know, not only like the, the relationship that you have with each dog, but how they respect one another Mm -hmm. in in their little pack. And man, I, I mean, I think we can all attest to the waterfowl hunt we've been on with a couple dogs that are probably a little on the whiny side, not necessarily staying put breaking early. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, we've all been there Mm -hmm. and to, to, to sit back with four or five dogs, completely still, completely calm. And you can say one of their names. You can literally say strike and he will break free from his place and come and heal at your side while the other dogs Mm -hmm. stay there. And then you can give him a back command if you're sending him on a blind Mm -hmm. or you can throw, you know, a dummy and send him into the, the lake at your house for a retrieve all while the other dogs stay completely stationary is really incredible Mm -hmm. it's so cool to see that and also just to see like the capabilities of what the dogs can can get to now you'll be the first one to attest it takes time it takes discipline it takes practice takes mistakes corrections but it's certainly doable and you have several examples of these finished dogs that are really exceptional Mm -hmm. and to your point too, then they're just so chill. Like when it's, when they're not working, they're just chilling. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it's, it's, it's really group. fun to watch that progression and it gets me excited about like the possibility now that we're going to be entering the phase of, you know, basic obedience and kind of building the foundation. The other thing that jumped out to me too, is just how important that obedience component is to the finish work. Mm-hmm. It's everything. It's really really stood out today when you see it in person um and i think that's a probably an area that gets rushed through in the training protocol it's like rushing through obedience because it's maybe not that fun when you're training your dog to like work on putting them on the leash and you know heal and sit and cut like the basic stuff not as fun everybody probably wants to get to like the train retrieve stuff or the introduction of the bird and gun things like that that are more enjoyable from like you as an individual mm-hmm. But it really shines when these dogs get to that finish level of how well the obedience plays into the finish work. Mm-hmm. Well, it's it uh, it is everything, and is it boring? It's mind numbing. I mean, it is it is not enjoyable to sit there on lead and go like, honest, honest to God, bless Dave's heart. The dude, like when he has a whole group of obedience dogs in, he spend an entire day doing obedience over and over and over and over and over again with all these dogs, but it's just obedience. It's come, sit, heal, come, sit, heal, your place. I mean, just like it is, it is not enjoyable. So we live in a day where everyone can get whatever you want with a click and two day shipping. Can't do that here, right? That's one of the things that I, I really, really preach is when you get a dog And you have these goals and you have these aspirations. Let's just say you want to take the dog through the whole thing, which not everybody does. And that's totally cool. Let's just say the whole thing, completely finished, blind retrieves, hand signals, completely finished dog. Okay. Well, you're never finished because that dog is going to get through hunting season and hunting season naturally unravels training season because you go from controlled environments and situations to uncontrolled and when uncontrolled situations come up, that's when bad habits start. That's when your training starts unraveling. You have to come clean it back up. So the one thing I really preach is I want you to fall in love with the process, not with the result. Because if all you're looking for is a result, and that's all you're trying to push for. One, when you do finally achieve it, you're not going to have loved and appreciated every step along the way that, that took it. Like, I want you to have a party. I want you to, hey, you've conquered sit. Like, don't just move on and do the next thing. Like, appreciate you and the dog did this together. That was a teamwork thing. This was an accomplishment, right? Pat yourself on the back, smile about it, enjoy it. Okay, now let's move on. But you're going to come back and revisit that. 
all my advanced dogs, which you got to see some of my young advanced dogs I have in for training. First off, they're killing it. Love, love watching that. But it's obedience. We had one of the, the guys that own um, one of the dogs. I won't use the name. He came in, watched uh, his dog work. And the first thing I do is an obedience session. The first thing every one of my advanced dogs do every single day is an obedience session. And he's like, man, like, you do that every day? I'm like, yep. He's like, why? He did that last summer. I'm like, well, he's, he's doing it this summer too. Because if you look at everything we do, right, it, whether it's lining you up for a blind, whistle sitting at a distance, giving you a hand direction and a cast, it's all obedience. That's all that this is. It is just obedience at a more advanced level. And so it's so important, but it's the part that everybody wants to rush through. And I think the reason everyone wants to rush through it, to be honest, is social media for the most part. Everybody wants to have something to, to show off on social and it's not fun showing off heel, sit and come. Yeah. It's fun showing off a big water entry into the water. It's fun showing off a blind retrieve and a dog taking a cast and a hand signal. Like it's fun. It's fun showing that part of it off. But I'm telling you, you don't get that without that obedience. And it's the part that everyone wants to go through because it's so, so boring. But that's also where you build a relationship with that dog. There is not a more intimate way for you to connect with the dog and communicate with the dog than through a leash. You have everything that you feel, everything that, that you know, if you're tense, if you're upset, if you're sad, the dog feels that through that leash. And so there's a connection there between you and that dog that you can't get anywhere else. And so having that time and really making sure that you spend time there is really, really important. Yeah. That's so apparent, man. It really is in the, uh, just witnessing, like I mentioned earlier, like the finished dog work. It's, it's something special, man. Like mm -hmm. I love the interaction with working dogs and their handlers, whether it's hounds chasing cats or bears, mm -hmm. whether it's a great short hair that's, you know, hunting down chuckers and big Canyon country waterfowl, like, there's just something really unique and special about that. And I think if you've ever owned your own dog and hunted behind them or worked them in any kind of category, you feel that you love that you yearn for that. And, uh, no doubt, like it, it comes through with the work that you guys do with your training dogs. Um, it's been fun to see, man, talk a little bit more about like the retriever roadmap map. Mm -hmm. So obviously you, you got to the business to where it's like, been able to be successful. You've got a great team of people. Whitney's heavily involved on the puppy side, but training dogs from a business standpoint, like you and Dave only have so much time in the day. Like mm -hmm. you, you kind of, you can't keep training more dogs unless you built out a team of more trainers. Mm -hmm. Walk us through like why retrieve a roadmap and you know, the whole idea behind that. Yeah. So, um, over the years, we've just had more and more demand for training, right? So more people want to get in. Um, we have, it's so interesting. I'd say the majority of the dogs we get in for training now are either flown in or driven long distances. Like it's, it's not that it's abnormal for us to get a Minnesota, Wisconsin dog in, but we went from that's all we ever got in to now having a dog flown in from British Columbia, Alaska, you know, like it's, it's pretty cool, you know, and what's really cool is we have like heavy Texas, you know, uh, clientele base, um, heavy Montana, heavy California. It's like the guy in, in Texas is dove season. Like my dog needs to be here September 1st for doves and they need to hunt this way where your guy in South Dakota is like, I don't like, what's a dove? Like, I just want a dog to go pheasant hunt and go bring my roosters back. Like, so even though they're a Labrador, they do so many things so well. And so it's, it's really digging into, okay, all right, so who are you? What do you hunt? What do you need the dog to do? And let's work on that. You know, so it, it's kind of an interesting thing there. But we could get bigger, right? Like we have a waiting list right now that I could fill four buildings of what I have right now. Four buildings. Why won't we do it? Because as soon as that happens, I lose the personal touch. I can't do stuff like this, but I certainly can't, like you saw me with multiple clients today, sit down and talk with people about their dog. I'm going to talk to you about your strengths and weaknesses. I'm going to talk to you about like what we need to do to elevate this dog to the next level. I want to talk to you about like what I think this dog is capable of or what I think he's not capable of. Like if we grow, I wouldn't even see that dog, yeah. let alone be able to talk to the owner about, you know, what it is because there's just not enough time in the day. I don't want to lose that. Like I really feel like that's, that's what makes us us. Right. So I don't want to lose that. But I also wanted to help more people. 
I was really struggling with how I do that. You know, quite frankly, Duck Dogs, the podcast was part of that. You know, I wanted to be able to, you know, have a bigger platform to be able to help, you know, more people and, you know, hopefully take nuggets from that, that and, you know, go with it. But what happened is there's just more questions, right? So more people sending you questions, you know, social media email of like, Hey, I need help here. I don't understand why my dog's doing this or like, what, 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 where do I go from here? And just, it got to the point. It's like, we have to do something. And so it took me years to do it, but uh, we developed Retriever Roadmap. And what we did is the whole idea behind the roadmap part of the name is we all want to get from point A, a puppy, to somewhere along the line, right? So you choose where your ending part is. Like I want a dog that's completely, you know, finished and elite. Well, you might want a dog that just simply sits, stays, comes, and will bring a bird back the two times you go hunting, Right. Or somewhere in between, like wherever you want, you choose that. But if we are both going to the same spot and we start in Los Angeles, we're driving to New York, we're probably going to take different routes to get there, right? Like one of us might want to take the interstate the whole way because it's the fastest. One of us might take scenic routes because we're going to enjoy you know, the ride a little more. One of us might go do in between, right? Take a detour here to see a state park. Like we're going to take different routes, right? But the important part is, is that whatever route is best for you and your dog that you know what that looks like. And the problem with books and DVDs is that it's like, okay, step one, do this, step two, do this, step three, do this. Well, no dog is a cookie cutter. Like I can tell you, we have 35 dogs in right now. We have 35 different personalities, different strengths and weaknesses. And we have to do different things with each of those dogs to get the most out of them. It's easy for me to say that because we've worked with hundreds and hundreds of dogs. If you're sitting there with your second dog, your first dog, how are you supposed to know that, right? So what we do is we take puppy and say, hey, here's my favorite way of doing it. Watch this video. Let's do step one, two, three, four, five, right? But if your dog doesn't handle this well, try it this way. Step one, two, three, four, like find what is best for you, right? Give you options, right? Is your dog super soft? Is your dog super hard-headed? Is your dog in between, right? Like let's find the best route for you. But the idea here is that through video, we can better teach people. Yeah, I think people have just been conditioned to, you know, whether it's, you know, YouTube, social media, you know, TV, like we're, we're geared now to be visual learners. This helps that because too often I was trying to talk with through people you know, on the phone of like, okay, you got to do this. And then they come back and like, I, I tried doing that. It didn't work. I'm like, how did you set it up? And it was like completely different than what I tried. So I didn't articulate it well enough, but if they watch it, they can rewatch and rewatch and get it right right? Go conquer that, take the next step. And, um, we made it super, super affordable. I think, you know, mainly because I wanted people to have access to this. I'm not looking to, you know, become a millionaire off this thing. I just want this to be available for people to go home and be successful. I personally, I love it when people train their own dogs. A lot of times people are sheepish when they tell me like a guy today, I don't know if you, you heard this or not. A guy today was picking up a puppy and he's like, well, uh, I, I think I'm going to train him myself. And like, was, he was almost ashamed to be saying it. And I'm sure it's because he's looking at me that this is my profession. And you know, I probably want this pup to come back in for training, but I love when people do their own work because you are going to go through the peaks and valleys. You're going to go through the ebbs and flows. And you are going to see the hurdles. You're going to overcome it yourself. Like if I do it, that's one thing you pick up a dog that's gone through it. But then when it happens in the field, you don't know how to get over it. Cause you didn't go through the training. You don't have the appreciation more times than not of what it took to get the dog there. Right. So then it's just a different level of understanding. You know, like I think so many people have the pride of going through this themselves now. And so retrieve roadmap gives you the tools as far as the knowledge and the guidance to do it. You still have to do the work, but at least now you have an aid of like, Hey, here's how you, know, you do this. Oh, that didn't work. Okay. We'll try it this way. Do you want to use knee collar? Do you not? We have both routes. Do you want to go through a train to retrieve? Do you want to go through hold conditioning? Do you not want to do this? Like, here's this, like a lot of different options. Um, I'm really proud of it. You really should am. be. Yeah. You guys did a great job. Thank you, you could tell the amount of effort and work that went into the production of it mm -hmm. because it's hours and hours and hours and hours and hours of filmed footage. Uh, the other thing I thought was cool, you didn't use finished dogs on the whole thing. You mm -hmm. used dogs that were in the same line that the class represents. Mm -hmm. So if it was a, a puppy obedience thing, you're showing young puppies that which were, made it very interesting. Oh, totally. <laughs> but you're showing the dogs that are literally going through it 
It wasn't like, here's a finished dog and this is what it should look like. And so in the videos, there's moments when things aren't quote unquote perfect, mm-hmm. because guess what? That's what we're going to run into when you're training a dog. Mm-hmm. Um, I thought that was super interesting and, and valuable. Uh, just like the, the way it walks you through step by step from literally the day you pick up a puppy all the way through an advanced finished dog in that mm-hmm. would represent the likes of a Brock or a mm-hmm. strike and everything in between. And you can take it at your own pace. There are some cool components of like the form and the community aspect I think is great as more people kind of get jumped in. So I've had time to kind of go through, I'd say 75% of the content, even though this was, you know, months ago, I started watching it just to kind of observe and see what it is. But I'm excited for my wife and I to, to utilize it, and leverage it. Mm-hmm. And I don't know what I have as a goal for the dog yet. I just, you know, time will tell. I could see myself fall in love with the training process and maybe trying to see how far we could take it. You know, it's interesting because when we first got Deuce, the internet was not existing. Like, dude, Hush didn't exist. <laughs> Instagram was not around. I think like MySpace might have been a, a thing at the time, but there was no online stuff. Like there was no great training videos on YouTube or any kind of waterfall content. It was all like outdoor TV or the old, you know, hardcover books or VHS tapes that my dad had laying around. So, so much has changed and I'm going to be a novice going through this process, but that's like exciting is trying to, you know, learn this new thing. And, you know, bird hunting, whether it's waterfowl or upland is such a great entry point for people that are just wanting to get into hunting. I think most all of us started our journey there. You know, Mm -hmm. I can vividly remember being with my dad hunting pheasant and ducks and geese laying in fields as just a kid, not even carrying a gun. And then packing around like an old single shot 12 gauge because my dad was preaching that you got to have one shot. You better make it good. So slow down, take your time. The thing kicked like a damn mule Mm -hmm. because it was so lightweight. But I killed most all my first birds with the single shot 12 gauge and really developed like a passion for bird hunting. And it's something that my dad and I still connect on today. And I'm really looking forward to getting back into doing more of that. Even though like the predominant amount of stuff we do is Western Mid Game, right? Like that takes up a lot of our time. So it'll be super curious how this kind of plays out. But the Retriever Roadmap is uh, really well done. You guys have done awesome work. And then you continue to add to it, right? Like you're getting feedback and updating training modules and answering questions that you're seeing populate as a common theme. And I think that's what's great is like it's a living, breathing program. It's not like the static thing that's going to collect dust. Yeah. And that was really important to us so that we continue to grow and continue to build because, you know, there's always going to be something else to capture. There's always going to be something else, you know, to teach people and the you know, things that we run into. I mean, shoot, I don't train the same today that I did 12 years ago. Yeah. You know, I have to evolve and I get better and I change and I tweak and we're going to do the same with the program. It's going to continue to grow. Um, I'm really looking forward to the hunting side of it, of like the, in the field on the fly training or like what we do to make dogs successful in the field. That's, you know, that's coming, which is, is super exciting to me. There's just so many things. And then, we have so many great partners, you know, industry partners that honestly, for some reason, I don't even know the reason all, you know, all the way through, but they want to be a part of it. So they're offering like major, major discounts to members of this thing because they see the community feel, you know, they, they understand that this is more than just, this isn't a click and a purchase. This is a community. And I am so proud of that community. I did not understand the significance of that. You know, I had a few people be like, oh, like this is this forum. I'm just not a forum guy, right? So a forum's going to be great, blah, blah, blah. I'm just like, oh, whatever. Like I'm more focused on the content. That's my favorite part of the whole thing. Because when someone asks a question, a lot of times I'm busy during the day and I'll get to this stuff in the evening. Sometimes I, I have six, seven, eight, nine people have answered the question for me before I've even seen it and had a chance to answer it for somebody. And it just makes me smile because all these people are like, oh, I saw the same thing. This is what I did to make me successful. And someone's like, oh, like I saw it too. That's cool. That worked for you. This is what worked for me. And it's like, well, here, here's your roadmap, right? Like yeah. now you have all these other branches of this road that all of a sudden start forming. It's like, oh, I didn't see this path here. Oh, I could also take that one. It is really a cool thing. And, and I mean, people are like networking as far as like understanding where they live and like linking up and training together. And it's really, really neat to see how this whole thing has kind of come together. Yeah, no, I I think you're spot on with that. And it'll be cool to watch it continue to evolve and grow as you get more feedback and more people are using it. But it's great, man. Like whether or not you have a brand new puppy or a dog that's four years old, but you're looking to try to like get 
him to or her a little bit different level, all of this would be applicable. Mm -hmm. And um, what a cool community to, to, you know, build and be a part of and really speaks volumes to what you and Whitney have been able to accomplish throughout yeah. your uh, short career. You guys are both still super young and lots of, uh, of more, you know, to give to the community, but it's, uh, it's been a pleasure to be a guest in your um, place of business and kind of watch you guys do your thing just as a casual observer as I'm taking shots and filming and trying to capture the essence of what Riverstone Kennels is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, we, we've, uh, we've loved having you guys here. And what I think is so cool about this, it's just the beginning. It is, you know, like we've got a long way yeah, ahead yes. of us, long road ahead of us, but this is where the fun starts, you know, and I, I cannot wait for you guys to, uh, as much as I want you guys to stay around for as long as, as I'd love for you to be here for another couple of weeks. When you guys take that puppy home and, and you know, now it's family. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that for It'll you. Be money. Yeah. Um, we haven't talked about this, but do we want to give out the Hush discount code for anybody interested in subscribing to the Retriever Roadmap and trying it out? Yeah, for sure. So what we did is we set up a Hush 22. So just all caps, Hush 22. And uh, that will get you $100 off the initiation fee Sweet. to uh, to get into that. So we felt like it was already very affordable, and now we're going to make it even more affordable. Again, you guys, what this really is, we just want you to be successful. We just want to help share our knowledge and our tools um, to go, you know, let you take a next step with your dog, whether that's, you know, just being obedient on the leash. You can go to you know, the kids' t-ball game all the way through, you know, being a more you know, efficient hunter in the field. So Use Hush22 at uh, at checkout and uh, save yourself $100. Uh, where can the people find you on all the socials? Okay, so uh, first off, Retriever Roadmap, um, www.retrieverroadmap.com, uh, Riverstone Kennels, riverstonekennels.com. Um, and then on social, we have Riverstone Kennels. We have Duck Dogs, again, D-U-K. And so you can find us on Spotify, iTunes, you know, anywhere you're, you're listening to your podcast. Um, and then also, uh, you know, with Retriever Roadmap on social as well. So you can search us in any one of those boxes and, and find us. If, uh, if you guys are interested, you liked more, um, you like the content talking about gun dogs, hunting, upland, Josh puts out an awesome podcast. He's got a super cool story um, about Strike and how Strike landed from Scotland in Wisconsin and kind of his first days in U S soil This is worthy of a listen. I'd highly encourage that one. And, uh, the puppy we're picking up has special meaning, man. Strike is the sire mm -hmm. and Sonny is the dame and walk us through the quick lineage before we wrap this thing up. Yeah. So, um, so if you remember back to the, the story of when I lost Easton, um, Jeff Lander, who's the person that connected us, had a dog in named Sage. And uh, Sage was, so Sage would be Sonny's mom, so your puppy's grandmother. Yep. And uh, so I lost Easton, couldn't bring myself to go train. And the first day that I went back, uh, probably again a week, 10 days later, something like that, I went up there and I just told the guys, you know, that worked for me, I said, guys, like, this is going to be hard, just load a trailer, and I just got to go by myself. You know, normally I have someone to come with me to help aid and, you know, kind of keep those. I just knew today was going to be tough. So I uh, get up there, you know, a lot of tears, you know, just, you know, just, you know, still raw, right? And uh, so I finally bring myself to, I have my, you know, advanced dogs with me, stuff is set up. I didn't load the trailer, so I don't know who anybody is. And uh, Jeff uh, currently owns Sage. He also owned a new puppy named Luke. Uh, and he was having to move, um, you know, into a new residence. And where he was moving to, he was only allowed to have one dog with him. And, uh, so we were kind of going back and forth before I lost Easton and he's like, man, like I just, I gotta, I, I can't have two dogs. I'm like, okay, well, what do you want to do? And he, so he decided that, uh, he was going to rehome Sage. And I was like, well, like, at least let me finish her training and then I'll help find a great home for her. She's a fantastic dog. I love her to death. Um, and I, at this point I've only owned males. I've never owned a female before. And, uh, so I get set up, go to the trailer open up the first door and that little head pops out and that's Sage. And she's just all wiggly. And I'm like, all right, you know, so I bring her out. And, uh, she just knew something was wrong. Like, you know, she's like leaning into me. She's like trying to make eye contact with me. Like she could just tell something was wrong. And so, uh, I went through and she ran the most flawless day of training that I've ever seen her do. 
And every time back, it was almost like, are you happy now? Are you? Like she was just it, trying to make me happy, make, trying to make me feel better. And uh, so on the last retrieve, she came, she brought it back to my side. I took it from her and I'm looking at her and she's looking at me. She had these big brown eyes. She's looking at me with this sweet little you know, heart. I called Jeff literally right there, still standing next to her. I said, Jeff, I'll, I'll take her. I'll buy her from you. And that, that's how I ended up with, with Sage. And Sage turned into, so she was 46 pounds, so little. She's the best Canada goose dog that I have, or I had, you know, I should say. Um, she, like this little dog, turned into a middle linebacker. Like when there was a cripple in the decoys, all my buddies like, wait, 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 wait. And they get their phones out and they want to videotape it because when I send her, it's whoom and you know, barrel rolls. And you know, I mean, she just had a heart that you couldn't teach. So that's, that's uh, so Sonny um, is actually my brother's you know, dog. My brother you know, like needed to have a dog from Sage because she loves, you know, he loves Sage so much. Um, and then now we have, you know, the next generation. What so. is also cool is Sonny came from sage Mm -hmm. and the dad was brock that's right yeah so you've got brock and strike right which to me really makes this even more special because here you have two of the dogs that i really deem as very special you know what was kind of neat about having you you here this week is you know you watch me work solo you watch me work tucker i think right and when i bring these dogs in from overseas like they're with me for minimum a year through training and that's my you know time to to deem are you special yep. or are you great? Or are you good? Only the special dogs get to stay. Yep. If you're great, that's awesome. But that means you don't check a couple of my boxes, which means I'm going to find a great forever home with you, which you will be a dog of a lifetime for somebody. But for me, I can't, I can't produce the best of the best puppies unless I am critical on where your flaws, where your faults, every dog has them. Where are they? And where do you fit on my scale, right? And I've had to break my own heart a number of times because I can't just, uh, I can't own dogs to own dogs, yeah. right? Like I, I, I think I own 11 of them right now. Like I can't just keep acquiring them. I'm, I'm the crazy dog guy. But, you know, those dogs go home and like Herbie was the last one that just broke my heart because like I just adored that dog, but he just, he just wasn't what I needed. Herbie flew off in his private jet, lives on a 30,000 acre <laughs> ranch, like, Herbie's doing just fine. Yeah, it broke my heart. Totally. You know, Herbie's fine. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that kind of stuff, you know, it's, uh, it, you have to be picky, um, but like you start dialing down to, okay, so there's Brock. So you're getting Brock through Sonny. Now you get Strike and you know how I feel about both oh, those man. dogs. Yeah. Like, like we, like that's how you, you have to have special dogs to get special puppies. And, you know, on top of that, man, the fact that Jeff's dog, originally sage ties mm-hmm. into this and he's the one that really was so profound in making this all come together is special in my heart totally and I so totally it's agree. uh something that we're so excited about we uh we take our little guy home tomorrow on an airplane so cross your fingers uh, wish me luck i have anxiety a little bit just based on like let's hope he doesn't whine and bark and you know poop and pee the whole time but uh we're optimistic we're gonna tire him out but a whole new a whole new chapter will begin for us tomorrow. So uh, I can't thank you guys enough for hosting us. Can't thank you guys enough for the friendship. Looking forward to making a lot more great memories out in the field and uh, just seeing where our little guy develops into, you know? Yeah, man. No, I uh, We love you guys. We can't uh, can't wait to see you know, where this goes. And I'm looking forward to many more hunts and fly fishing trips and everything else that we have in store for us in our future. So it's all good stuff. Absolutely, brother. Uh, Josh Miller, folks, thank you guys so much for uh, tuning in, and we'll catch you on the next one. <laughs>